Good morning, and welcome to Birmingham Unitarian Church. I'm the Reverend Mandy Beal. I am the senior minister of this congregation. I'm joined in the leadership of worship this morning by our accompanist, accompanist <laughs> Forrest Howell, as well as vocalist Brian Shandoval. Our worship associate this morning is Judy Amir, and we enjoy and appreciate the technical support of our communications coordinator, Sarah Constantakis, and our Zoom bouncer, Drika DeGraff. BUC is a spiritual home for all people of goodwill. We believe in justice and hospitality, and we have earned such designations from the Unitarian Universalist Association. We are a green sanctuary congregation, which means that we have educated ourselves and we strive to do our best to protect our environment. We are also a welcoming congregation, a term that specifically means that we are intentionally inclusive of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and queer individuals and their families. Our commitment to both of these programs was renewed this year. And although there is no such designation for racial justice work, we are deeply committed to that work as well. Our worship services are hosted on Zoom every Sunday morning at 1030 and then later posted to Facebook. After the service, we invite you to stay for a virtual coffee hour. You will be randomly sorted into breakout groups and we hope that you will stay and participate in this opportunity to connect with others. If you are worshiping with us for the first time today, we extend a special welcome to you. We hope that you will stay after the service and get to know us better. We have one announcement this morning. Members of the BUC community are invited and encouraged to participate in the Confronting Racism series. Our next session is on Tuesday night at 7 p.m. We'll discuss which race-related terms are appropriate to use and when. We'll also learn about the Black Lives Matter movement and discuss what our roles can be in this important, ro in this important work. The Zoom link will be available on our website and you can contact Mary Jo Ebert or Izzy Capoya for more details. Thank you again for joining us this morning or whenever you are watching this. Although we are not together physically, we are together in spirit and it is good to be together again. And with that, our service will begin. Although we worship in our separate homes this morning, we are joined by a multitude of Unitarian Universalists as we light our chalice.
This flame cannot live without oxygen and we cannot live without each other. Let us be a beacon of hope, love and joy that knows its worth and its interdependence with the world around it. It's in that spirit of our desire for unity that we join together in our opening hymn this morning, We Would Be One. Let us join together in singing. Now we're joined in singing our hymn of love to pledge ourselves anew to that high cause of greater understanding of who we are and what in us is true. We would be one in living for each other to show to all a new community. We would be one in building for tomorrow a nobler world than we have known today. We would be one in searching for that meaning which binds our hearts and points us on our way. As one we pledge ourselves to greater service with love and just to strive to make us free. Words this morning by Eric Walker Wixton. We come together this morning because within us there is something that knows we need more than we can find in our aloneness. We know instinctively in the depths of ourselves that we need others for this journey of life, even though we also guard our independence and individuality quite jealously. So let us celebrate all that makes us unique, yet also all that makes us one. And let us dream dreams of all that we can do together. We come back to this worshiping community because we have found value here. The words, music, and silence that we share, the relationships that we share, even at a distance, provide us with meaning and comfort in difficult times as well as in good times. The care and stewardship of this community is in your hands. Unitarian Universalism is a free faith without a centralized authority. And that is a privilege, but it is also a responsibility. We can't do this work without your financial support. Your contributions can be sent through our website or Venmo at, with username at BUCMI. Both of those giving avenues are free and easy to use. We are also more than happy to accept checks sent in the mail. Let there be an offering of support for this beloved community. Thank you. 
we have come to the time in our service that we have set aside for prayer, reflection, and meditation. We begin with a sharing of joys and sorrows from our community. We begin with a, an expression of joy from Amy Smalley and Cindy McLeod, who are celebrating their 25th anniversary today. They met at BUC almost 26 years ago. We have another expression of joy from Jane O'Neill. Jane says, after attending my latest BUC committee meeting, I am struck once again with gratitude for the chance to be connected with such fine people, caring, intelligent people who are willing to take action for what they believe in. I truly feel privileged to know you and to have you in my life. We have a note of concern as well this morning. Gloria C. Abrams wants us to know that Ray has recovered from his surgery and is doing well. Thanks for thinking of him. And I invite us also to continue thinking of him in the days and weeks to come. And a last expression of concern from Kelly Taylor. Kelly had a liver biopsy on Thursday and she is looking for thoughts and prayers that the results will be negative. And she thanks you for those thoughts and prayers. I invite you to move with me now further into a spirit of prayer and reflection. Spirit of love, spirit of life. We are grateful this morning for the shelter we have from the storm, the safe harbor and the port of life. Bring us closer together. May we be compelled to act for the greater good. May we love and respect each other, not in spite of, but because of our diversity. May we see the wisdom and the beauty of finding unity in that diversity. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. Spirit of life, come unto me, sing in my heart all the stirrings of compassion, blow in the wind, rise in the sea, move in the hand giving life the shape of justice roots hold me close wings set me free spirit of life come to me come to me Our reading this morning comes to us by the Reverend Marcus Hartliff, The Grout. The Unitarian Universalist congregation where I served as an intern uh, made a mosaic tree of life the summer before I arrived. Congregants of all ages came together to craft the tree's leaves using bits and pieces of broken ceramics, jewelry, glass, and stone. There are many precious personal items in the tree, including fragments of the Berlin Wall, a father's watch face, pieces of great grandmother's china, and a key to the front door of a loved home. Like the members of the community that brought them together, each part is imbued with memories and meaning. Each fragment holds a piece of truth. Unitarian Universalists are mosaic makers. We are a people who bring together the broken pieces of our histories and the shining pieces of our seeking. And piece by piece, 
create a mosaic religion. Our tree of life is found in the stories of our living tradition. The bead from a transformational moment of worship at a youth conference. The bit of paper stamped with the blazing emblem of the Unitarian Service Committee that saved lives during World War II. The button or patch on a backpack that proudly proclaims the first justice issue that lit our souls on fire. But our mosaic making tells another story too, one that is often more difficult to see, one that is essential to the purpose of religious community, one that lies not in the beautiful and broken pieces, but in the grout, grout the chalky, gritty stuff that is squeezed between the cracks of tiles. In a mosaic, the grout holds the image together, unifying disparate pieces into a whole. The grout of a community takes years to lay and settle. Grout happens in board meetings and committee meetings and endless emails and slow moving institutions. It is in weekly potlucks shared by neighbors, a ride to church, and coffee in the social hall after worship. While well, folks who show up for church only on Christmas and Easter will hopefully enjoy the beauty of the mosaic they find, they may never know the power of the grout that holds us through all the seasons of life. We help to make the grout when we learn each other's names and we reach out across generational divides. We help to make the grout when we show up on Sunday morning without having checked first to see if we're interested in the sermon. When a newborn arrives to be blessed by the community, it is the grout that enables us to welcome them. And it is the grout that we rest when we gather to grieve and memorialize a beloved one who has died. Hold us, O oh grout, gather us in through time and space, and make all our broken pieces whole in community. In our multiplicity, make us one. From each of our jagged edges, give us the shape of a communal beauty. So there's, there's a common misconception that Unitarian Universalism fell out of the sky in 1961. One of our goals today is to dispel that myth. In 1961, the Unitarians and the Universalists merged, but there was a whole lot of history before then. The roots of our living tradition stretch back thousands of years, if not always in a straight line. Looking into our history often brings perspective to our modern struggles. In the mid 16th century through the mid 17th century, Poland was a safe haven for religious heretics and political dissidents. This was not intentional, but it was a confluence of political and economic interests. At that time, the Polish monarchy was decentralized and almost democratic. Royal succession was decided through a vote by wealthy land-owning elite, which meant that those people had a lot of political power. They wanted to keep the peace so that they could protect their wealth. This was a time when wars were raging between Catholics and Protestants throughout Europe. So in order to prevent that violence from spilling into Poland, they made a declaration of religious tolerance. The peace in Poland did lead to the prosperity that they had intended, and that in turn allowed the sons of wealthy families to be sent off to Italy for education. Once their training was complete, they came home and they often brought with them humanist ideas. Now, when I say humanist here, I mean the humanism of the Italian Renaissance. When we say humanism in our modern context, we usually mean a belief system that rejects supernatural solutions to human problems. These 16th century humanists were not quite that, but their beliefs for, were absolutely radical for that time. 
common beliefs among these proto-humanists included the separation of church and state, pacifism, and shared wealth, a kind of communism light. These religious ideas, considered dangerous and heretical throughout the rest of Europe, began to cross-pollinate in free-thinking 16th century Poland. A new religious movement came forth, originally called the Minor Church, and eventually taking on the name Unitarian. Wanting to carve out a life that fit their values, the Unitarian, Unitopi <laughs> Unitarian Utopian community of Rakovia was founded in 1569. There really isn't a lot to say about Rakovia's first 30 years. There was a lot of bickering and power struggles, but no major accomplishments. In the year 1600, however, a change in leadership invigorated the ideals upon which the community was founded. They already had a printing press and they added to it a paper mill. And that gave them complete autonomy to publish at will. They also opened a tuition-free academy for young men of all social classes, which is radical at the time, and that attracted students from across Europe. And those free thinking, the free exchange of ideals fueled the Roman, the Rakovian <laughs> printing presses at an astounding rate. Rakovia was a hotbed of liberal heretical thinking. They accomplished a great deal in a short amount of time. They are perhaps best known for the Rakovian Catechism of 1605. It was groundbreaking. In a grossly abbreviated nutshell, it says that Jesus is not God, there is no original sin, and there is no predestination. The Rakovian Catechism as such was an insult to Catholics and Protestants. The unique circumstances in early 17th century Poland, plus the completely self-sufficient printing press meant that Rokovia was the only place in Europe where such ideas were generated and tolerated. And those statements would have led to execution anywhere else. As copies of the catechism made their way throughout Europe, Calvinists and Catholics came to agree on one thing. These ideas had to go. Printed copies were confiscated and destroyed, but Rakovia could freely continue to produce them under the protection of the Polish government for a while. Over the 100 year period of the Unitarian religious movement in Poland, Unitarians had removed themselves from civic life and thus given up their political power. They felt their core values, the separation of church and state, pacifism and shared wealth were incompatible with public office. This allowed Calvinists and Catholics to gain influence in the election of a new king, and the Catholics won. This new Catholic, Catholic king was completely unsympathetic to Protestants, especially the heretics in Rakovia. In 1660, everyone in Poland was given the opportunity to convert to, Cal to Catholicism or leave. And the Rakovian experiment was officially over. Over the centuries, there have been a number of Unitarian and Universalist utopian experiments. We have tried and tried again to rid ourselves of the trappings of culture and politics that prevent us from reaching our spiritual ideals. And how many of them have you heard of? Probably none. None of those attempts have enjoyed more than fleeting success, and in some cases, those attempts were disastrous. And yet, the desire to separate ourselves from people who don't think like us remains strong. Wouldn't it be great if we could surround ourselves with UU values and commitments? A lot of us imagine that future where the world is fair and everyone lives by our seven principles and we all get along and there is no racism, homophobia, sexism, or anything else that divides us. I don't think that I'm alone in recently harboring an escapist fantasy of moving to an uninhabited island and 
founding the country of UU Landia, or if you'll indulge me in a, another bad joke, UU Topia. We want to think that there is an escape from living in a world that does not share our values, but there isn't. It isn't possible because we are not separate from the troubles of the world. They are a part of us everywhere we go. Our seventh principle affirms that we are inherently, inescapably interconnected with all that is. We don't exist outside of society. We are society. We are a part of all that is even in an anxious political landscape and the crisis of a pandemic. We did not personally cause it, but we exist within its context. Whatever the problems of the day might be, we exist within their context. We are not above or beyond, only in relationship. And this is why our UU utopian communities have consistently failed. The problems of the world are not caused by a foreign entity like the devil. Problems are caused by people. We're people. And that isn't bad. Unitarian Universalism also affirms that we are born whole and holy. Remember, the Rakovian Catechism cast off the concept of original sin, and you would be hard pressed to find a UU that does believe in original sin. So if we are not born sinful, and yet we keep recreating the same societal shortcomings even when we shut ourselves off, and we reject the idea of outside evil influence from the devil, we are left to conclude that the origin of these shortcomings are not innate and they're not imposed, they are endemic. Therefore, to opt out of wrestling with the shortcomings to refuse responsibility for creating and for resolving them is morally indefensible. We can't create a special you use only clubhouse and check our problems at the door. Our values have been developed within the context of human society. They don't exist outside of them. Unitarian Universalist ideals, commitments, and hope for the future comes as a response to the ideals, commitments, and the reality of the world as it currently is. If that vision means something to us, then we are not free to keep it to ourselves. We value it, we have found it transformative, therefore we share it in the hope that others will value it and find transformation here as well. The ideals of the Rakovian experiment and its catechism have been passed down to us, are very much alive and well within our communities. The Rakovians rejected the collusion of church and state. We don't accept outside authority over our religious lives either, not even in our own congregations. Our fourth principle is the right to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And the fifth is the right to conscience and the democratic process. We do not accept outside authority. Now, there might be diversity in our stance on pacifism, but I think that we can all agree that baseless aggression is incompatible with our values and our commitments. Our sixth principle, the goal of a world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all echoes this. And again, we may not have such a literal embrace of shared wealth as our spiritual ancestors in Rakovia but we agree that people should be given every opportunity to be financially secure and have their basic needs met. We find that in our first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and our second principle, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. We want these things, but we can't want them only for ourselves. The grout that we become in our congregations must extend to becoming the grout of the world around us. Our principles, founded on the theology of Rakovia and so many other sources, are visions of the world, not just for you use, but for everyone. The inherent worth and dignity of every person, not every you you. 
we can't hoard these values, nor should we want to. We are one human family. We are bound together in the web of life. We all, all of us, share a common origin. We share a common destiny. The hopes that we have for unity and diversity in our congregations must extend into our communities and the larger world. We imagine, through that work, a world made fair. We don't get there unless we all get there, all of us. We can't move to that far off UU Landia. We've tried, it did not work. So we have to do what we can to make UU Landia right here and right now, through our actions and through our words. And it is in that spirit that our closing hymn is the kind of quintessential universalist hymn. See if you can hear in this, those visions of a world made fair and the work that we can do to create that in the here and now. Let us join together in song. to this world and spread the message that we are one, all of us, every single one of us, and we can make this world more fair, more peaceful, and more just with our work right here and right now. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. <laughs> 